the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. I don't know if you noticed there's a running theme this morning. We, we, we got the running theme so far? Holy Spirit? Um, it was really one of those bizarre things at the beginning of the week because if you know, I'm currently going sort of through the, the discipleship book that's come from The Turning and taking each subject heading and going through it slowly but surely. We've done uh, Jesus Christ, which then realized that we need to put some theological e- weekends together because there's a much bigger discussion. Last week, we discussed the Bible, to which I had people actually say to me, do you know, you actually made the Bible sound um, exciting and interesting. And it is, exactly. Thank you, Keith, and it is. But sometimes we, we forget that it is. We forget that it's exciting and interesting. And as I stated last week, uh, no movie of today has actually got any particular hold over the Bible because what you see in a movie, other than clearly spaceships, is actually in the Bible. It's much more exciting, talking animals and, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit at move and, you know, mass exodus out of... Got nothing on the Bible. So the Bible turned out to be quite exciting. So the next subject for today in the book was... Holy Spirit. Which was fascinating because um, Andy got hold of me and said, oh, right, um, I think we're basing everything around the Holy Spirit. I said, oh, that's fun. And then Margaret happened to say, oh, I need to advertise um, the new study that I'm doing in the house group, which is the Holy Spirit. So we're thinking maybe there's a running theme here of the Holy Spirit. So are you ready to sort of discuss the Holy Spirit or him, which is much better? Because he is the third person of the Trinity. He is a him. Um, Or he could be a her. Depends if you look at the original Hebrew and it's feminine. Anyway, we're not going to go down that route now. That's one for those theological theological afternoons that we're going to have here discussing these things. So, let's look at this. Jesus promised to send the Spirit to all who believe in him and gave their lives to him. Amen? There's a bit of basics here, folks. So bear with us. When we become Christians, God seals that transaction by his giving us Holy Spirit. Amen? So, you know, it's like rubber stamped or waxed in. You know, when at the old times when they used to seal, drop a wax, seal it? Same sort of imagery, really. And I've just recognized that Galatians makes it very clear, 4.6, that we have an infilling that demonstrates that we are accepted as children of God by the Holy Spirit. Now, it's at this point, I just want to make a very quick and rapid comment. I do know that some denominations teach that after you've been baptized, within literally days, you should be speaking in tongues. And therefore, that is a guarantee that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and that you've been saved. What do you think my comment on that will be next? What a load of baloney. And what I mean by that is there's nothing wrong in speaking in tongues, but it does not mean it is a sign completely of salvation because tongues is just but one gift. It is but one gift. And actually, according to the Apostle Paul, it's probably the least of the gifts because it's really there about edifying you a lot more if you've got it, where actually all the other gifts of the Spirit are about edifying. Okay? So it is one thing. I've not got no problem if somebody comes out of the water and they're bursting out into tongues. Absolutely fine. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But it is not the be all and end all as a sign that you are filled with the Spirit and a sign that you are saved. Because I think it's done more pastoral damage to people that they think, <gasps> and they fake it, or whatever else, because they don't want to look bad in front of people. If they're being taught that you... Do you see what I mean? So it's a particular passion of mine. I get quite annoyed because I've had to deal with people who, who are literally think they're not Christians. And it's just ugh, ridiculous. Anyway, my own particular example is it was seven years after my baptism before I started speaking in tongues. I was preaching before that. So... You tell me which one means I'm filled with the Spirit. 
So let's just, just, just knock that on its head, shall we? And as we say in 1 Corinthians, it makes it very clear that uh, there are gifts that are distributed by the Holy Spirit to edify the church amongst all of us. And as Paul, I think, says in 1 Corinthians 12, 30, do all speak in tongues? And the answer is no. So does that mean no? So I just want to just, just get that done and dusted and out the way. So um, it is but one gift and it's not the be-all and end-all because actually we should eagerly desire prophecy because that edifies the church. I think we should eagerly desire wisdom. Quite frankly, in our society, I think we need wisdom and abundance. Um, and um, there you go. Anyway, off my hobby horse. The Holy Spirit lives in us as a guarantee of his promises, yes? Let me just quickly flick to Ephesians. Wrong way, Warren. Ephesians. You know, God is really being gracious to me. He did it again last week and he's doing it again this week. The minute I put my thumb in, get it, I've gone to the passage I need. Anyway, uh, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, which he promised long ago. Yeah, carry on. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. God's promise. I know this is all very basic, but I think we forget the basics. And if you're talking to a new Christian or somebody's just prayed the prayer of salvation, it's useful for them to know about the Holy Spirit. We'll come to why in a moment. But he promised it long ago, and Elizabeth actually quoted that I'll pour out my spirit upon your sons and your daughters and your old men dream dreams and all of that. That's what God promised, and that's what we have today because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay. Jesus encouraged believers to wait until they experience the power of Holy Spirit. See that in Luke 24, verse 49, John 20, 19 to 22, and Acts 1, 4 to 5. Jesus said, wait until you're empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know, some believers don't realize they can receive the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Acts 19, 1 to 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then, they, then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. That seems to get not missed in some teachings. It's just, oh, they spoke in tongues. But they also prophesied. So these people have been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, but they hadn't realized there was the power of the Holy Spirit. And that needed to be imparted to them. And Jesus told his disciples, and we all know this, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Verse 8, Acts chapter 1. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we receive power when we receive Holy Spirit. Amen? So, slightly more in depth then. Luke 
24 uh, verse 49, it says, And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Now, some translations have that particular Bible verse talking about being clothed, inverted commas, with Holy Spirit. Yeah? We, we have to be clothed in the Holy Spirit. You're all clothed today, aren't you? It was a bit chilly this morning, wasn't it? And the idea of walking out in your swimming trunks probably didn't appeal. No? Didn't you, didn't you feel like walking out barefoot, you know? No, that's what I thought. So, um, it's the same thing. So, we, we, we walk out clothed. Why did you walk out clothed? Why did you put on extra clothing today? Who put extra layers on this morning? I actually put a new scarf on because I thought, oh, it's a bit chilly. Huh? You're not chilly. No, it was chilly. It's not chilly in here because the heating's on constant at the moment. It's great. Do you know, I walk into a warm office every day at the moment. It's like a miracle. But you all put on some, some put warm clothes on, some put sort of extra furry clothing on, um, you know. Um, yeah? Some got a warm cup of coffee now because they're obviously chilly. And... Um, to warm themselves up on the inside. So we all put extra clothing on. Nobody would walk out into the chilly cold with nothing on, would they? No. So when that Bible verse talks about being clothed in the power of the Spirit, it is about that imagery of actually needing to be clothed with the Spirit before you go outside. Why would you go outside into the world without the power of the Holy Spirit? You with me? But why would you... Why would you you wouldn't, would you? If you've been given, okay, it's uh, Siberia, it's the depth of the winter, and somebody says, before you go outside, put on this really super warm jacket that's designed to protect you from the chill that's outside. Would you refuse it? You wouldn't refuse it, would you? You'd accept it, wouldn't you? What would you do with it? Come on, let's, let's go through the imagery. So uh, here's the jacket. I really have got to convert to the tie, Mike. Here's the jacket. It's so what you do. You stick your hand in, wouldn't you? Yeah? One arm in, flip it round, stick it in the other. Yeah? And do it up. Why don't we do that with the Holy Spirit? Does it mean that it's not there, though, if you can't see him? No. So, so he's there. He's constantly present. We just got blasé. So, but if you walked outside without that jacket on, you wouldn't be so blasé, would you? You'd walk out of Siberian and you'll go, oh, that's cold. What did I forget? Oh, yeah, that jacket that someone freely gave me. Go back in, close door, put jacket on. Ah, uh, this is better. Yeah? Good. It's the same thing. It's when we go outside without the Spirit and recognizing His presence with us and we've clothed ourselves in Him and the power that He brings, what happens is we walk outside and it's, it's when we go, oh, why, why do I not know how to figure this stuff out? Where's the wisdom? Where's the ability to see things that should be happening before my eyes? Why can't I see beyond what is staring me in the face? I know. I forgot to spend time with God and get a refill of the Holy Spirit. What would you then do when you realize that? Go rushing back in? Quickly go to the toilet at work and pray? I'm not being funny, but, you know, pray at your desk or wherever you would. But if you've forgotten, and we do, we Christians seem to forget. We seem to get up and get on with the day forgetting something. So we need to be clothed, and we'll come to that a bit later on. So if we need to be clothed, do you know who else needed to be clothed in the Holy Spirit? Jesus. Jesus did not perform one miracle until the day of his baptism because the Holy Spirit had to come upon him. Jesus couldn't operate as he did without power of Holy Spirit. There is no recorded miracle at all prior to his baptism. So therefore, he needed the Holy Spirit. So if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do 
we need Holy Spirit. And Jesus actually promised, didn't he, later on? He said, you'll be doing more than I am doing. Not because we're better than Jesus, because we most certainly aren't, but because of the power of Holy Spirit. I, I just want you to think for a minute. Our Lord Jesus Christ, sinless man, died for your sins, rose again from the dead because of the Holy Spirit, needed the Holy Spirit to, to, to operate and do all his ministry and to basically fully function fully as a human being. I, I think that's one of the key things we've got to recognize. He ha needed the Holy Spirit to fully function as a full human being. He did none of his miracles in his godness. I said this two, two weeks ago. He did none of his miracles as his nature, divine nature as God. He did everything in the power of the Holy Spirit that was sent to him by the Father at the time of his baptism. And he did that so he could function fully as a human being. So if he had to do that, Do I need to do the dot, dot, dot? So we, we, we're with us so far. Good. So it's at this point, I would say, that we need to eagerly await the Holy Spirit to always fill us. I've always said this, we're leaking pots. You know, it's quite biblical that we are leaking pots. I'm not going to use the old adage, we're crack pots and all that sort of thing. But we're leaking pots, yes? We, we, we get filling and we let it sort of flow out and drain out and disappear on us and leak. You know, we've got, we got probably more leaks in us than the water board has in their main pipes that run through the, uh, the underground. We leak the Holy Spirit. So we need a fresh infilling every day. Jesus had to do it. That's why he went and spent time with the Father. He didn't just go and spend time with the Father just to spend time with Daddy. He went to spend time with Daddy so that he could be filled with the Spirit. I'm going to keep doing this until I get sort of some sort of this, this smiling at me or something. Thanks very much. That works. So we should be asking, eagerly waiting, actually re requesting. I mean, Liz didn't know how much I was preaching on this, so she's right that it's the Father's delight to pour out his Spirit. So, he likes to do it. Now, just to clarify, this doesn't always mean that there's a massive outward display of his power with people falling over everywhere and complete chaos, though I do wait for the day that happens here. But the Holy Spirit deals with each person as they wish to be dealt with. Therefore, if you enjoy quiet prayer and a gentle wind filling, then that's how the Holy Spirit will deal with you. If you want to have the full-on, go for it, the whole hog, Lord, the whole lot, he'll do that as well. I suppose what I'm trying to get at is, don't worry about what's happening to the person next to you. Don't worry about what's happening to the person next to you. If you're sitting there quietly going, this is enough, Lord, this, this is fine, this I cope with, Lord's going, okay, fine, that's all right, my child, I'll, I'll give you what you want. And if the next person next to you is shaking violently, doing lots of weird things, and bizarre, just, just leave them. Don't worry about it. Same spirit working in the same strength, just in a different way. What else is Holy Spirit there for? What is, what is his other role? Um, we're going to come to a bit later on some more gifts in a moment. But this is his other role. It's not just about power and miracles. Um, it's actually there to be called uh, for the life that we're called to do. And the other thing is Holy Spirit's there to convict us of our sin. Now, this is the bit where some of you start shutting down. 
Oh, sin. Yeah, let's not mess in the S word, shall we? But the Holy Spirit's role is to convict us of our sin. John 16, verses 8 to 11. Discovered I probably need to go for an eye test because I really am struggling to read now. And when he come, no, let's uh, go back a bit more. Um, but I am going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it's best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. The advocate being has lots of different words, comforter, encourager, counselor, Holy Spirit. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Holy Spirit does point out to us something that's wrong in our lives. He does convict us of a particular sin in our lives that needs resolving. Now, why does he do that? He does that so that between you and God, it can be highlighted and dealt with. Because when you've got a known sin in your life, one that you repeat or you keep sort of, you're not dealing with it with God at all. You're almost excusing it, parking it to one side, etc., When you've got that there before you all the time, you're actually living the half-Christian life. You're not reaching your full potential because you're hanging on to it. So the reason the Holy Spirit convicts you of it, note the word convicts, it's like pointing it out. It's not going, it's this, come on, let's sort this. Because you're living a half-life. You're not living the full potential of a human being in the power of the Holy Spirit that you can. So that's why he points it out, because he wants you to be free. It's really the whole reason for the Holy Spirit, so you can be free. If Jesus couldn't live without the Holy Spirit, then we most certainly can. And the whole point is so that you're fully free. So if the Lord is pointing out to you a sin in your life, it's because he wants you to be free. Because we carry that sin. And sin weighs us down. Seems to be a strange silence. It weighs us down. So, Holy Spirit wants to convict you of it, to point it out to you, so you acknowledge it exists. And not just acknowledge that it exists, because there's nothing worse, I think, than we acknowledge that it exists, but don't actually do anything with it. You know? Oh, yeah, 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 I know I've got that, but that's all right. God's grace will cover that. Yes, but you're living a half-life. Who wants to live a half-life? Anybody want to live a half-life? Anybody received a cup of tea and you've gone, it's a bit half empty, why is that? And who's expecting a full mug? And your statement is, sorry, is the tide out? Yeah, I'm an, uh, yeah? You don't like receiving a half mug of tea, do you? I don't, especially when I was expecting a full one, right? So therefore then it's the same thing. Who wants to live a half life? So if the Holy Spirit pointing out a sin in your life, don't sit there feeling condemned and wretched and awful. Recognize that the whole idea of it being pointed out to you is so that you can start acknowledging it and dealing with it. With God or even with others. You, you know, some sins we have to acknowledge before others and actually then go and maybe get, you know, help, professional help. We need to be accountable to people. Because who wants to live a whole life? Who wants to live a whole life? I don't see many hands up. Sorry, some of you got half hands up. That's not telling me a lot. Unless you've got a bad elbow, stick your hand up. Who wants to live a whole life? Yeah. So why, why ignore where Holy Spirit's going, let's just deal with this, shall we? Come on. Acknowledge this before me, before God, and maybe before others to help you, people who are not going to condemn you, people who are not going to judge you, but want to help you. 
Said it two weeks ago, and I'll say it again. Did you know if you're a Christian with the Holy Spirit in you, you can actually live a sinless life? You can actually live a sinless life. What's the point of the Holy Spirit in you if you can't live a sinless life? Don't you concentrating on that, but, you know, something to attain for. It's God wants us to live freely. So maybe when you're talking to the Holy Spirit, saying, please fill me, you're also saying, search and know my heart. Point out any offensive way in me. Because I want to live a full life. Something else Holy Spirit does. He doesn't just give us the seal of approval. He doesn't just convict us of sin. He doesn't just do dishing out supernatural individual gifts like healing, tongues, hospitality, wisdom. Any other gifts that you'd like to point out? Would you like me to go through 1 Corinthians 12, but it's not an exhaustive list? Hospitality, by the way, is a spiritual gift. It actually takes quite a lot to be hospitable to people, especially if you don't like them. That's why you give them half a cup of tea. Just thought we'll note that later. Wisdom is something we need, ad infinitum. Prophecy is something we need, ad infinitum. Holy Spirit dishes that all out, but he does one thing that's really amazing. He guides us. He leads us. Holy Spirit is actually, as I think John 3, 8 states, nobody knows where he's blowing, basically. He does his own thing. We're not meant to figure him out fully, because strange enough, he's God. And he blows wherever he wants to. Our role is to follow him. Yes? To go with him. And unfortunately, he doesn't take us always to the nice, peaceful places we want to go to. Ever want to be led beside quiet waters every day? Yeah. Anybody want to retire to the country? I've got at least 20 years yet. Don't worry. I'm not going yet. Or you might be going, no, go. So, but he doesn't necessarily guide us to places that we want to go to. He might be taking us to places that are really, really uncomfortable. And, it, and I'm not talking just physical places. I'm talking to, you know, a place of interacting with people, spiritual place that we might find really uncomfortable initially. But once we finally get there, we go, oh, okay, yeah, you, you, you're strengthening me for this journey. Oh, you're actually giving me all the wisdom I need for this. Thank you very much. But he, he likes to lead us. I don't know if you noticed with Holy Spirit, he really has this annoying habit of not telling you where the end destination is. He doesn't actually tell you where the end destination was. I, I was saying last week, if I'd realized when I gave my life to Jesus that I'll end up being in ministry, I don't think we would have got there. Bear with me. There's a reason being, because if he tells you right at the beginning, in 1993, by the way, you're going to go and be a minister. We are talking, how long ago was that now? 20 years ago? No, I can't even work it out anymore now. Uh, to 2003. Yeah, 20-odd 20, 20 years ago. Yeah. If it was 20 odd years ago, me 20 odd years ago, we would have gone, <laughs> goodbye, thank you, thanks very much. Ministers are for people who are clearly very holy people. So God deliberately, Holy Spirit does not tell you what the end destination is. It's always about the journey. Because if you knew where you were going to end up, where's Barry? Oh, that's a shame. I bet I wasn't that amazing listening to Barry sing. Yeah, I really I was moved. Okay? Bet if you said to Barry a year ago, Barry, you're gonna stand up there and all on your own, unaccompanied, you're gonna start singing over a microphone. I landed on what his his answer would have been. <laughs> so that's why Holy Spirit doesn't tell you the end destination. He takes you on the journey. Our role is to yeah, that's a new sound effect, by the way. You can emoji it, take it down now. Yeah. So, 
So, but he wants to guide us bit by bit. Our role is to follow him, not to worry about where it's going to end up, but to go step by step. And he is wild. I'm sorry to mention that to you, but he, he doesn't like being boxed in because he likes to push us to our fullest. Does, with me? He, he likes to guide us to who all that we can be in Christ. That's his role. Now, we can contain him, believe it or not. We're able to constrain him. Because I said, he deals with us individually. He doesn't just override our brains. He doesn't, because if that was the case, there'd be no relationship. We'd just be robots. Does that, yeah? So we can contain him. We Believe it or not, we can actually limit what he does. You, you saw that um, with Jesus when he, um, he went back to his hometown and he couldn't do very mi many miracles there because two things were going on. The people in the whole town just looked and went, well, that's just little boy Jesus, isn't it? Don't you remember him? And so they didn't have much faith in him, and so they were able to contain what the Holy Spirit could do in their own village. So that's quite something, if you think about it. We're talking about our Lord Jesus Christ was restrained from being able to do what he could do because of the people of the village were not allowing Holy Spirit to be activity because they were constraining him. So that means that we can do the same. So when we were singing that song right at the beginning, I didn't know what any of the songs were being chosen. We were singing that song at the beginning, and, and Andy led us really well in the whole bit, you know, have your way among us. And then eventually went, why don't we convert that to have our way among, have your way among me. Now that's a scary proposition. But is it? Because who believes that God loves them? Who believes that Jesus died for your sin and rose again? Who believes that Romans 8.28 states that God works for the good of all of those that love him? And, and that's an ultimate good to the absolute end, by the way, folks. That's our end home, which is not this home. It's the one with Jesus. But who believes that God wants the very best ultimately for us? Holy Spirit. Who, who, Jesus said he sent the Holy Spirit, yes? So he sent the Holy Spirit for our ultimate best. So why would you contain your ultimate best? Somebody came up to me. I keep using this analogy, and it's true, but I'm converting it now. Somebody came up to me and said, here you go, Warren. Here's the keys to an Aston Martin. It's a bit of a worldly thing, but here's the keys to an Aston Martin. I think Aston Martins just look sexy. Most attractive car probably ever built. Give me keys to that. Here you go. What do you think I'm going to do? Reject it? Or do you think I'm going to get in it and go for it and enjoy it to its fullest? Because they go fast. Do you know in the James Bond film where they had to, um, they, he flipped it over about three times, I think it's uh, Casino Royale or something, they couldn't actually, normally the stuntman, when they're driving one of those DBs, they can literally take it into a corner and they swing the wheel and they know how to flip it. Yeah? Now, I've never actually flipped a car yet in my life. Come close. It was a Peugeot 106. Swung it. And it went down a bit of that. And it came back down. And it was my supervisor's car at the time. I think Joy was in me in the car. It was Pat's car. Yeah. Anyway, it was almost, but not quite. But in the DB, you literally, you, they, you had to do it. They couldn't do it with the DBs. They had to put a little explosive underneath it to make it flip. Because it was so stable and so rock solid, it wouldn't shift. It wouldn't flip as it, like most cars do. That's how well designed it is. It, the DB7 holds the road. It can go like nuts and go like crazy, but it knows where it's going and it won't shift unless it's a little explosive. Holy Spirit is just the same. Knows exactly where he's going, goes like crazy, goes like that, but he's the most faithful spirit you're going to ever have and won't flip you and won't make it overly dangerous. Does that make sense? Won't lead you down a wrong path. He'll take you down the path that is best for you ultimately at the end of the day and best for others around you. So why would you want to live a half-life? Allow Holy Spirit to 
guide and lead you, to convict you of your sin, to deal with your sin, and to give you every ounce of power that he can give you. Amen? That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. But we limit him. Please, let's not limit him. Let's allow him to have his way. Because the early church, first 10 chapters of Acts, read them. The early church didn't have a clue what they were doing, by the way. They didn't have any academic answers. They were just chasing after the wind. They were just, oh, I think God's working over here. Woo! Let's go for it. We have the same. God loves us. God wants the very best for us. He wants the very best for your families. Maybe actually some of our containing of the Spirit is not helping some of our friends and family come to know Jesus because we're not being wild enough. Now, as I said, he deals with each of us in our personality and our character. But you know within yourself if you are deliberately going, okay, Lord, there and no further. Allow Spirit to blow. You know, if the Holy Spirit didn't blow in the way that he did, none of us would know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. Because it's the Holy Spirit who first starts opening up your spirit to the acknowledgement that God exists. So let's take a few moments. Talk to the Lord for yourself. We actually don't come into the presence of God unless Holy Spirit is involved. So now as you're talking to God, Holy Spirit's involved in you coming into his presence. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.